Hi guys and welcome to Quick Guides for Medicine, short videos designed to help you get your mind around things to learn in internal medicine. My name is Fatai and I'm a th current third year resident at Brookdale Hospital and uh, Medical Center in internal medicine. Uh, today we're talking about acute coronary syndromes again. Um, we did the previous video was on the diagnosis of uh, unstable angina and NSTEMI. For this video, we'll talk about unstable angina and treatment. Remember, guys, how we do it for every diagnosis. You ask yourself the question, how does it present? Throw in risk factors in there as well. How do you test for the disease? And finally, how do you treat? So we are in that part now for unstable angina and NSTEMI. How do we treat? Just a couple of things I forgot to mention in the previous video when we talk about how um, acute coronary syndrome will present. We talk typically with the chest pain, but I forgot to mention a very important part there. And then in certain groups of patients, you may not necessarily see that chest pain. So you think about, you know, females, for example, or elderly patients uh, or diabetic patients may not necessarily give you um, the, the typical chest pain um, with um, acute coronary syndromes. It might require, you know, further testing, you know, cardiac enzymes and all of that. But anyways, back to this now. Um, treatment. So, let's just put those diagnoses here again. I, I'll keep throwing in STEMI here just because I don't want to leave it out of our consideration. <laughs> Obviously not, right? All right, so I put unstable angina there and STEMI, all right, and STEMI. More so, we have similarities with the treatment in in. in there's more similarities with the treatment as opposed to the diagnosis with these um, diseases. So, let's assume several things. Let's assume that this patient came in, all right? Let's assume that this patient came in with, you know, the typical chest pain, right? Um, Non-specific EKG changes, or even ST depression or whatnot, um, they have positive, right? Positive or negative troponin. We can very well still, based on the symptoms, right? Still make a diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome, in this case, whether it's unstable angina or NSTEMI, all right? So we made our diagnosis. We did the further testing. Remember, we did, you know, echo, all right? Um, we probably did, you know, some further testing as well, some other labs with a hemoglobin A1C and lipid panel. All right, so we made our diagnosis um, of unstable angina and STEMI. Remember, these guys are definitely acute coronary syndrome. And it doesn't matter whether it's unstable angina or N-STEMI, we're still dealing with acute coronary syndrome and the treatment for both of them is going to be the same. So what are the hallmarks? What are the hallmarks of treatment for unstable angina and N-STEMI? We want to divide the treatment into several categories. We can group one, I mean, make one category here as a symptomatic relief. All right, so here we're just going to have things like your nitroglycerin. So be, remember, uh, basically that would reduce the preload and eventually reduce myocardial oxygen demand and, you know, just kind of slow down the damage sort of. Um, you can put your pain medications here as well. Yeah, you can give some morphine. Morphine, all right. Um, so... We can then talk about medications that actually reduce disease progression. Disease progression. And these are the super important ones, okay? So first on your list is your dual antiplatelets. Dual antiplatelets. Um, on top of that list is your aspirin. All right, and then you can choose your P2Y12 inhibitors. That's what makes your dual antiplatelets, okay? So, we have several options here, okay? 
The number one on top of that list is your Ticagrelor. Ticagrelor. But remember, we also have an old timer here, Clopido Grill. There's another guy. There's another guy, Prasso Grill. I'm just putting that here just, you know, to have so we're not leaving anything out. But to be honest, it's probably not even considered if the patient is not getting um, uh, a, a stent. All right. So in, in, in most cases, aspirin will definitely be there. And then you can add to the aspirin ticagrelo. In comparison, uh, ticagrelo and clopidogrel, ticagrelo definitely uh, you know, beats clopidogrel in terms of uh, mortality benefit and all of that. Um, but there's certain cases, whether for insurance reasons or whatnot, um, you may not be able to give the patient ticagrelo you give clopidogrel. It's just... It's just um, it becomes valid at that point. Prosegrel, remember I told you, would not necessarily be considered here except they have an extent uh, or um, it's, it's so many other reasons why probably some compliance issues and all of that where because Prosegrel is a one-day one medication um, as well. Moving past that, moving past that, um, Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, prostaglyl is also going to be contraindicated with patients with recent strokes or elderly patients because the risk of bleeding is much higher with that. Moving past that, we will go and talk about our anticoagulation because here we're talking about antiplatelets, here we'll talk about anticoagulation. So what are, the, what are our options for anticoagulation for NSTEMI and unstable angina? We have the low molecular weight heparin, Oh, we have the unfractionated heparin here, all right? So, if it is ACS, you have to use one of them. The guy that would tend to favor is low molecular weight heparin because he has decreased risk of bleeding as compared to unfractionated heparin. Um, the only reason why you might want to use unfractionated heparin, for example, will be in ESRD patients. But for most other patients, there's renally adjusted doses even of low molecular weight heparin, and that will be sufficient. Um, so for all of these treatments now, for all of these treatments... How long do you do them for? This guy here, you typically would do for about 48 hours, all right? You typically do for about 48 hours, but for the dual antiplatelets, at least a year, one year, if there's no reason to stop it. If there's no reason to stop, even if they get a stent, it's still the same indication. You use it for at least a year. If there's no reason to stop it afterwards, you can use the aspirin, uh, continue aspirin uh, for, for life. Um, so what are some of the other disease, uh, some of the other medication we can throw in there? There's some medications that would definitely continue to mortality benefit. They just have mortality benefit generally. Others with mortality benefits. Benefits. All right. So we go, where do we begin? We can throw in our beta blockers here. Do you stop beta blockers right away? Maybe not. I remember, remember we mentioned um, uh, pre-discharge stress testing for some patients. So beta blockers may, may affect the results of your of your stress test. So it's important to know when you're starting your beta blocker, make sure it's not like they're gonna have, you know, stress testing right the next morning and then that messes it up. You might wanna hold that. Basically, beta blockers should be started somewhere, you know, within their hospitalization. Maybe in like another 24 hours, it's fine. It doesn't really make a difference, but make sure you start it before they get discharged. That is the point. Um, before I go into to some of the other, you know what? Let me just add that here. In patients with systolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, ACE inhibitors will be definitely recommended, right? If they have uh, uh, systolic dysfunction, ACE inhibitors or your ARBs, all right? ARBs will definitely, definitely um, be recommended or your spironolactones might also be thrown in here. Aldosterone antagonists. 
it's not very clear whether you start this right off the bat, all right? But if they have systolic dysfunction, these guys also have some uh, benefit. But you, you typically would want to start this at least um, about 3 to 14 days after the AMI. All right, so it's it's you don't you, it's I'm throwing it in there so you know the medication to start, but you typically don't want to start it right away. Um, ACE beta blockers within, you know, 24 hours is useful. All right, ACE inhibitors or A or ARBs also you can start within 24 hours. Is also useful, but be 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 mindful of the kidney renal function for these medications. By the way, be mindful of the renal function because that may that may determine whether you do actually start it or not, and the degree of their renal dysfunction. So, what else can we throw in here? Um, nitroglycerin, we already mentioned. Already mentioned anticoagulation. Oh yeah, the big guys. Statins. All right, statins. Regar remember this is important regardless regardless of their lipid profile so that's important important thing to mention regardless of the lipid profile you should definitely give them statins so even if they had the ldl of like 50 yes give them statins um typically we will even want the ldl to to be lower than that um, if that is not enough, you add something else. Um, what else can I add? You know what? Let me let me go back quickly. Remember, I mentioned the fact that these patients with NSTEMI or unstable angina may eventually require cardiac catheterization. Right? Remember, I said that at least within twenty four hours, typically. Um, so, if that is significant, if remarkable. And, you know, if they get a stand, if PCI is done, treatment is pretty much the same as I've mentioned here. All right, treatment is, treatment is, 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 is the same. But most important thing for that in, in that regard would be your dual antiplatelets. All right. If PCI is done, this is the guy that, you know, that that you're most concerned about, your dual antiplatelets. If, obviously, if you've done PCI, maybe they're not having the chest pain anymore and you may not need your nitroglycerin pain or, or pain medications um, if the pain is no longer there. And if they've gotten PCI done, you don't need your anticoagulation anymore. Guys, that's important to know. You stop the anticoagulation if, gotten P if they've gotten PCI. Um, but your dual antiplatelets becomes very important. Another group of medication that people ask, I'm not going to put it here. I'm not going to put it, in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to put it here. GP2B3A inhibitors. This is only used when they get PCI. Other than that, there's no clear indication. And it's just a short-term infusion. If the PCI was, you know, problematic or whatever, you know, you might use it for six hours, you know, and that's it. That's that's it. You don't use it afterwards. The medications that they're going to go home with, let me just, let me use an, a different color, all right? Your, the dual antiplatelets, obviously, all right? The beta blockers they'll go home with, all right? If there's systolic dysfunction, either your ACE or ARBs, Ideally, all right, your statins definitely, definitely they're going home with. So all the medications they're going home with is, is, in, is in green there. Um, what else am I missing? So remember we said we're doing TTE. So based on the TTE, based on the TTE, you might have to involve other things, all right? So for example, based on the TTE, have they have low ejection fraction. Uh, let's say that is less than... Uh, 35, for example, all right? If the ejection fraction is less than 35%, all right, so this will be an indication for an AICD. But please note, please note, the AICD should be only placed after 40 days of the AMI. 
40 days after MI, all right? If they got a stand, if they got a stand, you should wait at least 90 days. All right, so AICD is something you may also consider. But in a nutshell, those are majority of the treatment considerations we do, we have with unstable angina and end STEMI. Um, we'll talk about STEMI, the diagnosis, the treatment in the next video. If you have any specific questions, please feel free to put them in the comment section below or email me, residencecove at gmail.com. I'll, I'll put in the description below. Thank you so much for, the, uh, for, for, for hanging out. Uh, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.